Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is March 22nd, 2020. And this is a reading of an article called Helen Keller, Why I Became an IWW. Before we get into the article, please take a minute to like, share, subscribe, comment. All of that helps boost this channel and get Socialism for All more established so that we can keep spreading our educational message and discussions about socialism. So into the article. Um, this article is hosted at IWW.org. And of course, IWW is in the title of the article. What is an IWW? IWW stands for Industrial Workers of the World. The IWW is a radical labor union that was founded in 1905 out of the merging of a number of other labor unions for the explicit purpose of being a revolutionary labor union that would end capitalism. In other words, while other labor federations at the time, such as the AFL, uh, which exists to this day as the AFL-CIO um, for complicated historical reasons, it was able to swallow up the CIO basically as a result of McCarthyism, um, which weakened the CIO. But uh, while the AFL was generally more reactionary and contributed to sort of a labor aristocracy of like white male breadwinners who were able to unionize for the purpose of like elevate, elevating themselves up above the rabble as kind of like teacher's pet of the capitalist class. The IWW was organizing the unorganized and really just down to the dregs of what was considered unskilled labor. So keep in mind 1905, this is a time that a lot more um, automation was coming into industry. So jobs were less, quote, skilled. And a lot of it was more like manning equipment, pushing buttons, pulling levers, rather than like, you know, doing fine woodworking or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> the IWW uh, saw these people like new classes, well, not classes, but kind of like new levels of the proletariat emerging where workers not only were still in the same position um, as they'd always been in in capitalism where they had to uh, sell their labor and their labor was the only commodity that they had to sell to get by in life in you know to get money to live in capitalism but that even the type of work that people were being made to do by the emerging technology was like less and less skilled and um, again, the craft unions didn't want anything to do with them. So the IWW was a union for all the workers, as they said, they wanted to do one big union of every industry from public service to mining to agriculture. They wanted to get all the workers into one union for the, and then set up uh, general strikes and basically take over capitalism. And uh, we'll read the IWW preamble probably in a different recording. Um, it's a very important organization in uh, U.S. and world labor history. So let's actually get into the article, my prefatory comments here aside. So Helen Keller, why I became an IWW. An interview written by Barbara Bindley in the New York Tribune, January 15th, 1916. I asked that Miss Keller relate the steps by which she turned into the uncompromising radical. She now faces the world as Helen Keller, not the sweet sentimentalist of women's magazine days. I was religious to start with. She began in enthusiastic acquiescence to my request. I had thought blindness a misfortune. Then I was appointed on a commission to investigate the conditions of the blind. For the first time, I, who had thought blindness a misfortune beyond human control, found that too much of it was traceable to wrong industrial conditions, often caused by the selfishness and greed of employers, and the social evil contributed its share. I found that poverty drove women to a life of shame that ended in blindness. I then read H.G. Wells' Old Worlds for New, summaries of Karl Marx's philosophy and his manifestos. It seemed as if I had been asleep and waked to a new world, a world different from the world I had lived in. For a time I was depressed, her voice saddened in reminiscence, but little by little my confidence came back and I realized that the wonder is not that conditions are so bad, but that society has advanced so far in spite of them. And now I am in the fight to change things. I may be a dreamer, but dreamers are necessary to make facts. 
Her voice almost shrilled in its triumph, and her hand found and clutched my knee in vibrant emphasis. And you feel happier than in the beautiful make-believe world you once had dreamed, I questioned. Yes, she answered with firm finality in the voice which stumbles a little. Reality, even when it is sad, is better than illusions. This from a woman for whom it would seem all earthly things are but that. Illusions are at the mercy of any winds that blow. Real happiness must come within, from a fixed purpose and faith in one's fellow men, and of that I have more than I ever had. And all of this had come to you after you left college? Do you, did you get none of this knowledge of life at college? No, an emphatic, triumphant, almost terrifying denial. College isn't the place to go for any ideas. I thought I was going to college to be educated, she resumed as she composed herself, and laughing more lightly, I am an example of the education dealt out to present generations. It's a deadlock. Schools seem to love the dead past and live in it. But you know, don't you, I pleaded through Mrs. Macy and for her, that the intentions of your teachers were for the best. But they amounted to nothing, she countered. They did not teach me about things as they are today or about the vital problems of the people. They taught me Greek drama and Roman history. They celebrated the achievements of war, rather than those of the heroes of peace. For example, there were a dozen chapters on war where there were a few paragraphs about the inventors, and it is this overemphasis on the cruelties of life that breeds the wrong ideal. Education taught me that it was a finer thing to be a Napoleon than to create a new potato. It is my nature to fight as soon as I see wrongs to be made right. So after I read Wells and Marx and learned what I did, I joined a socialist branch. I made up my mind to do something, and the best thing seemed to be to join a fighting party and help their propaganda. That was four years ago. I have become an industrialist since. An industrialist, I asked, surprised out of composure. You don't mean an IWW, a syndicalist? I became an IWW because I found out the Socialist Party was too slow. It is sinking into the political bog. It is almost, if not quite, impossible for the party to keep its revolutionary character so long as it occupies a place under the government and seeks office under it. The government does not stand for the interests the Socialist Party is supposed to represent. Socialism, however, is a step in the right direction, she conceded to her dissenting hearers. The true task is to unite and organize all workers on an economic basis, and it is the workers themselves who must secure freedom for themselves who must grow strong, Miss Keller continued. Nothing can be gained by political action. That is why I became an IWW. What particular incident led you to become an IWW? I interrupted. The Lawrence strike. Why? Because I discovered that the true idea of the IWW is not only to better conditions, to get them for all people, but to get them at once. What are you committed to? Education or revolution? Revolution, she answered decisively. We can't have education without revolution. We have tried peace education for 1900 years and it has failed. Let us try revolution and see what it will do now. I am not for peace at all hazards. I regret this war, but I never regretted the blood of the thousands spilled during the French Revolution. And the workers are learning how to stand alone. They are learning a lesson they will apply to their own good out in the trenches. Generals testify to the splendid initiative the workers in the trenches take. If they can do that for the masters, you can be sure that they will do that for themselves when they have taken matters into their own hands. Don't forget... The workers are getting their discipline in the trenches, Miss Keller continued. They're acquiring the will to combat. My cause will emerge from the trenches stronger than it ever was. Under the obvious battle waging there, there is an invisible battle for the freedom of man. Again, the advisability of printing all this here set forth. And this finally from the patient's exhausted gentle little woman. I don't give a damn about semi-radicals. Gradually, through the talk, Helen Keller's whole being had taken on a glow, and it was in keeping with the exalted look on her face and the glory in her sightless blue eyes that she told me, I feel like Joan of Arc at times. My whole becomes uplifted. I, too, hear voices that say, come, and I will follow, no matter what the cost, no matter what the trials I am placed under, jail, poverty, calumny, they matter not. Truly, he has said, woe unto you, 
that permits the least of mine to suffer. So again, that's a brief interview originally published in 1916 in the New York Tribune of how Helen Keller became uh, dissatisfied with the Socialist Party and democratic socialism in her day, trying to win gains for workers uh, through the legislature. And um, the IWW's hands-on approach to just taking the bull by the horns, organizing at the point of production, which was very successful for a very long time. The IWW, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was founded in 1905. It, like many uh, old left organizations, um, suffered greatly under McCarthyism. I mentioned how the CIO was cut down to a point where they kind of got swallowed up by AFL, which was a real shame because AFL, well, actually in the context of the IWW, was uh, really antagonistic to some of um, the more radical labor unions and the IWW used to call them the AF of hell. Um, as they would engage in union scabbing, they would have their union workers scab against striking wobblies or IWWs. So uh, definitely a preeminent force in US radicalism was the IWW. Um, I'd say around 1960, uh, I have an interesting article from a, well, I think it's actually a passage from a wobbly history book um, about how kind of by 1960, it went down to about 200 members and nearly ceased to exist. So, you know, again, that's uh, that's what McCarthyism did that, you know, by the mid 50s or 1960, really a lot of the radicals were just driven out of U.S. society, civil society, and that, you know, even including labor, uh, labor unions and this kind of like pall of conservatism uh, fell over everything. But um, another side of Helen Keller you may not have known, and we'll be posting more IWW and more Marxist documents on this channel as well as current events. So that's the video, facebook.com slash socialism for all, patreon.com slash socialism for all. Again, it's March 22nd, 2020. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment. Thank you very much.